Good afternoon, AUC community. It's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to this uh, campus conversation. My name is uh, Dr. Sharif Ali. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the American University in Cairo. Uh, it's my sincere pleasure today to welcome everybody. And in particular, this is the first campus conversation to involve uh, President Ahmed Dalel, the 13th president of the American University in Cairo. Um, so amongst our distinguished panelists today, of course, Dr. Ahmed Dalel, president, uh, Dr. Ihab Abdurrahman, provost, Dr. Ashraf Hatem, counselor, uh, Dina Borei, VP for student life, and Shirin Shakir, VP for management and operations. So um, I'd like to uh, mention that today's campus conversation, uh, President Dalel will give us an overview of his current plans and priorities. Uh, the conversation will also include updates on the university's ongoing management of the pandemic. And as it is customary, there will be an opportunity to answer questions from the audience. So we will first begin with a brief update from our panelists, and then I will open the floor to questions from the attendees. So the first thing that I'd like to uh, start with, uh, President Ahmed Dalel, welcome again to AUC for the nth time. And uh, it's our sincere pleasure to have you today. So amongst the uh, headlines of AUC today, um, we've seen uh, you know, terminology like care, culture, excellence, community, and so on. Uh, in the latest Senate meeting, you've also gave a sneak preview on what you had, had, had you know, imagined as some of the priorities that uh, should exist at AUC for the next uh, years to come. So uh, let me start off with the uh, following question. Uh, I read that you are a very strong believer of liberal arts education. Uh, do you see yourself as a guardian of liberal arts education at AUC? Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali. B before I start, uh, allow me just to say a few words about a few members of the community that we lost in the last few days uh, to recognize them uh, before we, we, we commence with, uh, with our conversation. Um, in the last few days, uh, we lost Dr. Sami Aqabawi, Professor of Information Systems in the Department of Management. He previously served as AUC's uh, Associate Vice President of Computing, uh, where, as many of you know, he developed the strategic master plan for the development of universities' computing infrastructure. We also lost uh, Professor Emeritus Dr. Mahmoud Lozier, an educator and an artist who spent more than 30 years as a member of the Department of Comparative uh, uh, English Literature and later in the Department of the Arts. He, as many of you know, he was a playwright, actor and director who appeared on stage, television and, and film. Um, and performed and directed both in English and, uh, and in, in Arabic. We also lost uh, Ms. Uh, Gazbia Sirri, uh, who's a world famous Egyptian painter and former AUC instructor and historian of art in her, in her, in her own right. Uh, her art, as, again, as you all know, adorns the halls of AUC and has been internationally celebrated. And last but not least, we also lost uh, Humphrey Davis, Davis, one of the most astute translators uh, who's been affiliated with AUC and with the AUC press family for many, many years. Uh, their loss will, uh, will certainly leave a, a hole in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, within the community. And uh, I, I extend on behalf of all of us uh, deepest condolences to their families and to you, their colleagues and students for this loss. Uh, now to go to your uh, question, um, uh, again, uh, before I start, let me begin by thanking the AUC community uh, for its very warm welcome uh, to me and to my family. Over the past few months and weeks, I've met amazing members of our community uh, from among the faculty, students, and staff, and I'm really uh, uh, privileged to be uh, to be working with you. Now, to come to your question, you asked me about liberal arts education, and uh, yes, I am a strong believer in liberal arts education. I think uh, uh, the liberal arts education approach uh, uh, I mean, first of all, some of the most important universities in the world adopt a liberal arts education up, uh, approach. And this is true of the greatest universities, global universities, uh, as it is of, of many exceptional colleges and, you know, throughout, uh, throughout the world, but especially in the United States. Uh, and as, as you know, we, we, we model our, uh, our educational uh, model after American institutions. Um, 
in addition to that, AUC is one of a handful of institutions in the region that actually adopt a liberal arts education approach. So this is, it's not just we, that we model our educational system after these leading uh, models in higher education, but it's also we have a unique responsibility at the regional level, along with a, with a small number of sister institutions that are committed to liberal arts, many, many institutions. Uh, that have a role to play. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to download to, to, to downplay the, the role of other institutions. They have a role to play. They speak to, to specific needs uh, at, at the national and regional level, but they tend to focus um, on on uh, on specific professions. Uh, what characterizes our approach to education is that it's informed by multiple disciplines. Our students are exposed, regardless of the of the area they choose to to to, to focus on. They're exposed to multi, multiple disciplines, and this definitely equips students with traits that other students lack. They're able to reach out across uh, silos and disciplines. They're able to deploy. This is our hope, of course, and this is why we commit to this model. They're able to deploy multiple perspectives in solving real life problems. As we know, real life problems cannot be solved and will not be solved in, in, in specific silos. They can only be solved, um, you know, if you think of water, uh, issues, challenges of water are technical, they are economic, they are social and so on and so forth. They are political. So you cannot address any, any of the real life problems that, that we deal with unless you approach it from multiple perspectives. And this is a unique characteristic of a, of a liberal arts uh, education up, uh, approach. And as I said, there are only a handful of institutions at the regional level that commit to this model. Um, uh, this said, uh, a liberal arts education approach is not, there isn't a single formula that is applied everywhere that fits every single time and, 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 and location. So we have to rethink what this particular model means at this time in history and within the context in which we operate. So we cannot just take the, this system for granted. We need to revisit it, rethink of the best ways of deploying it in, in our context and, and in, in this particular point in time. Excellent, thank you. Um, so you've been duly listening to people over the past uh, duration since you've started uh, you know, onboarding into AUC even before your formal inauguration. And uh, lately you've started to highlight some of the uh, big keywords associated with some of the hotspots that you've identified that need attention at AUC. Uh, and you've coined them as uh, the presence of the, some staples, uh, as you mentioned, some foundations. Uh, you've uh, highlighted some issues pertaining to very quickly, I'm not stealing your thunder, quality, uh, strategic enrollment, communication, et cetera. And I'm not going to talk more. I'll, let, I'll give you room to talk about this. So can you share with the community again what you had seen as very hotspot areas that need attention at AUC? Um, uh, gl gladly. Um, you know, and I'll say a few things and please feel free to to ask me more or to push me more on some of these uh, on some of these uh, issues and ideas. Uh, to start with, I will constantly be in a mode of listening and learning. This means, in practical terms, that I will do my very best to engage with, to learn from, and work with our community, uh, with our faculty, with our students, staff, alumni, and the many many friends of AC. Uh, and this, of course, will be the way we as an administration collectively will work with and engage our community. So along these lines, uh, as you probably know, as I mentioned, I think in, in the last uh, Senate meeting, I'm already working with the Senate leadership and we'll soon discuss with the Senate Executive Committee a roadmap for the work that we need to do together. I met with students, I met with alumni, and I'm... I'm keenly aware of the need to engage with the student community with the student body and with our alumni community and I'm you know I'm, I'm already thinking along with with our colleagues on ways to, to to promote this engagement now in terms of plans and priorities uh, my general observations since starting to engage more deeply with members of the AC community uh, which by the way includes of course the the board uh, visit last month uh, uh, as 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 uh, many of you know we had a we had a strategy session and of course we had an opportunity to engage deeply with a number of issues uh, um, uh, that that we need to be working on um, so uh, 
my 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 uh, my general observation is that there are areas around which we have the most we have for the most part consensus that we need to focus on and address. Uh, this doesn't mean, of course, that there aren't differing viewpoints. This is not an exhaustive list. Uh, uh, but and we need to engage in conversations to enrich our discussion and ultimately to enrich our decision making. But there are common themes or common topics on which I think we can begin to work immediately. And we have. We've started to work on a number of, of fronts, on a number of issues. These areas span things like uh, enhancing inter interdisciplinary academic programs in critical disciplines, and identifying, as you said, steeples of excellence, what I refer to as the areas in which we're strong, where we need to build capacity, where we can, and we already have strength, and we already can make an impact, we already can make significant contributions to our, to our societies and in education, and we need to sort of facilitate the work in these areas and, 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 and uh, give the work that we do in these areas a boost and support them to the extent that we can. Um, um, so interdisciplinary academic programs, uh, ensuring that our campus evolves fully into a lively city of learning that brings us together as faculty and students and as uh, alum, as uh, you know, including alumni. Um, you mentioned fostering a culture of care for one another and, of course, tackling the operation and efficiency challenges across the university. So these are some of the general broad headings, uh, to name only a, a, a few. And we're already working on, on a number of, 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 uh, of issues in each of these areas. But again, we're just beginning the work. You know, I don't come with, uh, as I said on several occasions, I don't come with, I come with experience, but I don't come with a ready-made agenda. The agenda is something that we have to work on together. We have to develop together and then, and then uh, start implementing it together. So uh, the, list, the list will grow and evolve. Uh, as we work systematically and as we work method methodically uh, and jointly uh, on each of the items we, we prioritize. Um, so I don't know if this is sufficient. I, I don't want to speak too much. Yes. If you want me to elaborate, I will. I, I, course, certainly. I elaborated so, a little more during the Senate meeting, and I realized I took more time than I should have. So, <laughs> Yeah, so... so um... So one of, one of the things that uh, I've heard you speak about is quality. And one dimension of quality could be the perception about the quality itself. And perceptions about quality are extremely difficult to manage and extremely difficult to uh, control and change. So uh, how do you, what do you see about the issue of quality, overall quality at the AUC, uh, you know, the perception about quality and so on and so forth? Well, the, maintaining quality is a is a continuous struggle. You cannot maintain quality if you don't always uh, work on ensuring that whatever distinguishes us as an institution is something that we are always nurturing and working on and developing. So, you know, if you lower your guards, if you don't, uh, you, you know, if you depend on on your uh, on your uh, past and forget about the future, you know, things will slide. Uh, so. Again, without without speaking to any specific challenge, there may be areas where we could do things better, and if there are, we should do them better. Uh, and we're working on assessing these types of things and trying to you know to to do better. On the other hand, the issues about quality could relate to perception. So, and I think the reality is somewhere in between. Uh, the issues of quality could relate to, to perception. And if it's a question of perception, not reality, if we still think and believe, I mean, the first thing we need to do, we should always look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we doing the best we can? Uh, we will not be able to do everything. We will never be able to do everything. But what we do should be exceptional. This, is, this should be our aim and should make a difference within the larger ecosystem in which we operate. And I underscore the word ecosystem because we don't operate in vacuum. We operate within a country. We operate within a country that has a network of educational institutions. So we need to always think of the way we, we relate to that, that ecosystem. So we should always start by looking ourselves in the mirror, asking ourselves if we're doing everything we can, everything in our capacity. When people ask questions, we should take them seriously, not dismiss them, think about them. And if it turns out, if we are confident that we're doing what needs to be done, 
then the thing that we should be doing is communicate what we're doing to our constituencies, to our stakeholders, not just our constituencies internally, but communi communicate externally so that our environment knows what we're doing and appreciates what we're doing and to correct misconceptions if there are any. So first, let's assume it's not a misconception and let's ask ourselves the difficult questions and make sure we're doing everything in our capacity. And then once we do that, if there are still, if there are, if we think there are misconceptions in the way we're perceived and the way our work is, is, is perceived, then we need to work on a strategy to communicate our, our good work to, 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 to our environment and our community. Yeah, I'll switch quickly to uh, Provost Ihab Abdurrahman to give you uh, uh, some room and I'll come back to you, President Dalel. So Provost uh, Abdurrahman, I'm sure you've been working closely with uh, President Dalel over the past duration. Can you, are you able to uh, expose to us some of the highlights of uh, your discussions, your plans also as pertains to the academic area? Yeah, I, th I think I can, what I can say is I repeat what Dr. Dalel just mentioned a few minutes ago, that yes, we had uh, we have been uh, discussing a few areas uh, that we would like to address, like more of interdisciplinary program at UC. We look at our strategic enrollment management uh, and the definition of uh, what do we mean by excellent students that we want to attract at UC, revamping of our uh, uh, financial support system to our on students uh, connecting co-curriculum to uh, curriculum uh, and make sure that actually it's well designed to serve our students. All those topics come during our uh, discussion in addition to the day-to-day -day, to day -day operation to ensure excellence uh, at EUC. That's wonderful. So, so one of the things that has been uh, spreading around the community is, uh, you know, uh, many of many of the people believe that uh, we have some inflations of programs in campus, the number of programs and so on and so on. Um, are you able to tell us a little bit more about is this really the case? Uh, do we have an inflation of programs? Are we restructuring programs on campus? So uh, what I can say that uh, at least through uh, the years, my years at UC, since I joined the, uh, UC in 2006 till now, I have been noticing that we have been adding programs, uh, a program after the other. And we have lots of data on that. And we really did, rarely uh, close the program or mm -hmm. actually consolidated programs uh, when needed. There is currently a review program uh, that's going on for all of our academic programs. And that's a good step to actually look at our programs closely and find ways to improve their performance. Uh, but part of the strategic enrollment management that we have been looking into, and there is an advertisement now for a new associate provost for strategic enrollment management. And uh, when we hire him or her, they will start working with the community on and putting a strategic enrollment management uh, plan for the university. Part of that uh, uh, work is to look at our programs, the enrollment in each program, the enrollment at EUC at large. Part of the discussion that Dr. Dalal also spoke about in the last uh, couple of months is uh, what is the right size of uh, our student body. And that's all related to uh, the size of our programs as well, uh, Dr. Ali. So I'll, I'll, I'll give the floor to Dr. Dalel for one last question then before we start to talk about COVID. Dr. Dalel, you've mentioned repetitively that you want to lead with care. Can you quickly elaborate about that? What, what do you have in mind? Care. <laughs> Caring for each other and for our community. Look, there is a, I mean, I'll, I'll be very honest and, and even blunt with, uh, with everyone. Uh, I mean, already in the, my limited engagement, I've, I've identified areas that need work, but I intend to work with all of the people involved to fix things. If I identify a problem that needs fixing, I will work with the people involved to fix that problem rather than, you know, it's not a blame game or we need to work together. We need to care for each other and work together and teach each other. We are an educational institution after all. I mean, we are in the business of education. We learn and teach. And we need to learn from each other and teach each other so that we do a better job. We have a responsibility to our, towards our community. There are gems in this institution. I keep on, I mean, I've actually 
I mean, I've been excited when I first encountered AUC and I knew about, of course, AUC's record, but my, my intimate close encounters have only reinforced the, you know, the admiration that I have for members of this community and for the amazing work that they do. And I, that, I keep, I mean, that sense keeps on growing by the day. So at the same time that I'm more aware of the problems that need solving, I'm also more aware of the opportunities that we have in this campus. Uh, and the amazing capacity and talent that we have in this campus. We really have a significant role to play. We have amazing things to contribute. And it's our responsibility to make sure that our operations are on par with the great talent that we have in, in the institution that and are serving the institution efficiently. They are serving members of our community efficiently, whether it's our students or our faculty and so on. So when I talk about care, you know, I just want people to know that wanting to fix things doesn't mean that I want to blame anyone. I, it means that I want us all to learn from each other so that we can do things better. Um, this is a starting point. And, uh, you know, I mean, care doesn't stop internally. It's, a, it's an attitude. It's a commitment. It's an ethical uh, position that, that individuals and institutions take. We have a responsibility to each other. And we have responsibility to the society in which we live, and we need to act on both. Uh, so, you know, I mean, there is more that I can say, but I think there are questions that that uh, members of our audience would like us to address. Exactly. So I'll switch now to Provost Ehab Abdurrahman uh, to maybe start speaking to us about the general updates on the university's COVID response. Uh, Provost Abdurrahman, do you want to go ahead and uh, uh, take the floor? Yeah. I'm muting myself. Okay. Yes, Dr. Ali. Uh, I think uh, the first I would like to say is now we have been back to campus for almost uh, two and a half months. And uh, during that time, we learned a great deal of uh, how to adapt and our approach to uh, cope with the situation of COVID. Uh, one of the key takeaways is that we have learned that uh, uh, it's essential for our educational mission that we be together on campus and to do that uh, safely. At the same time, we realize that the pandemic is not over and it will not end very soon. And we have to help each other and to come together as a community to find ways to remain together on, some, on campus and, 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 and safely at the same time. Uh, we have established a scientific advisory committee over the summer to help us, uh, to guide us with our decision regarding COVID. Uh, the committee has been doing a great work and they have actually addressed the community in the previous community conversation. And I'm, I'm, I know also that Dr. Hassan Azazi and other colleagues uh, will uh, address the community during the next campus conversation. Uh, and they will talk about dashboard, the, the, our dashboard and the details of our dashboard. And uh, uh, why are those numbers? How did we come up with those numbers? They will address all of that during our uh, uh, next uh, uh, campus conversation. Uh, people have been also asking about uh, what's going to happen in the winter session and as well as the spring of uh, 2022. Uh, as of today, we will be offering the winter and the spring face-to-face, uh, -face, the same modality as uh, uh, fall 2021. Uh, winter schedule has been already posted and uh, the spring schedule is being prepared to be posted very soon. So, um, um, and I'm happy to answer any particular questions after that, Dr. Ali. Thank you. So we have a question from uh, Kim Fox. Uh, is it true that we will now allow alumni on campus? If so, um, you know, uh, that the best idea when COVID cases are increasing and we don't quite have our situation order, uh, so she's asking basically about allowing alumni on campus. Is this going to happen anytime soon? Provost so, yes. Uh, um, um, the task force to reopen the campus or to manage the situation during COVID on campus have decided uh, that we will allow vaccinated alumni uh, to campus. Uh, they have to show a proof of vaccination before they access campus and they have to request that. And yeah, so the short answer, yes, we allowed vaccinated alumni to access campus. So an another question, uh, you know, indicates uh, we probably need to think about our capacity to keep the community safe. Um, so as the person asking the question is saying, and it's an anonymous uh, person, 
Um, so the Dean of Office uh, of Students Office complains of being too understaffed. Uh, the clinic is obviously understaffed. We can't be excellent unless we are safe. So uh, what do you say about our capacity with regards to handling the current COVID situation? If I may pass that question to Dr. Dina Porai and our vice president uh, our vice president for student life and also uh, uh, our uh, vice president uh, for operation and management uh, ms shirin check please go ahead um regarding the complaints yes i do and have received complaints on uh, email from students regarding the uh, response time um not it, it was it, it's got to do with um the manual processes that um the clinic have to deal with and um, we are improving it. And I think, and I hope that um, the community will feel um, and, and see a, an improvement in, our, in the time that the, uh, re, when the case is reported and finally when we communicate uh, with faculty. Um, and I will leave it up to VP Shireen to explain that how we have improved the process between the Dean of Students and the, um, and the uh, clinic to make the process much more um, efficient and faster. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. So yes, we, we are improving and we're focusing on streamlining and enhancing our response times um, in response to, to um, having known of a, of, a, of a positive case in class. So we are, we've started internal reporting and as of beginning of November, we've only had two uh, late notifications going out to, to students and faculty. And the, and the main reasons for that is usually a student reporting himself late to the clinic. So after two to three days of having been of the uh, after the onset of symptoms. So I just want to clarify that the delay is not a process delay. We fixed that part of, of and part of the issue was getting the class lists in time and this we've automated and we're still in the process of further automations that will be enhancing the process further. But to, to date, we're, we're, we, I mean, we've overcome that, that those delays that were um, taking place and we're working on further automations that will be coming in, in the coming few weeks. Uh, uh, but, but again, I wanna focus on and, and, uh, and really uh, emphasize that so sometimes delays come from a person reporting that he or she had symptoms two to three days ago and therefore it's a perceived uh, delay in reporting. However, it is not because that's when the actual case got, got to be known um, on the clinic side. So we are enhancing, we're improving in terms of resources. We've added a couple of, a few temporary resources to help us out in this period. So we are definitely getting better and we will be seeing um, a lot more responsiveness and which has already taken place currently. Yeah, I, I'd, like, I'd like, thank you so much. I'd like to give room to uh, Councillor Ashraf Hatim to give us some updates on the pandemic in Egypt in general. Uh, Councillor Ashraf Hatim, please, do uh, you want to give us an update on that? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharif. Uh, now we are in the, uh, still in the fourth uh, wave uh, of COVID. And uh, we, are, we are plateauing. The, the cases are still there, but they are not increasing much. And that's why uh, we are waiting for in the next few weeks to come down so that we will we'll announce that we have reached the peak and then it is coming down. The, and uh, So, so it seems we're losing Dr. Hatem. Uh, Dr. Hatem? Okay, so. Uh, yeah. uh, also, the, the thing which is good up now that uh, the Minister of Health announced yesterday that there are uh, four. Uh, 43 million. Yeah, you're, you're breaking up. So uh, let, let me let me switch the, the doses of vaccine in Egypt during the last uh, few the end of uh, of this year. Uh, uh, this is number one. Uh, number two, uh, as for for the ACG, okay. Yeah, so, so allow me to switch the conversation uh, where you're breaking up. So 
uh, I'll, I'll give the room to uh, VP Shreen Shaker to talk to us more about, uh, you know, back to campus management. Uh, VP Shaker, can you tell us more about that? You have some points to uh, state. Yes, sure. Uh, so, I, I mean, we're, we're very pleased that now we're around the two months mark that we've been fully uh, back to campus and fully operational uh, in regards to face-to-face -face classroom teaching, which is which had which had been on hold in terms of a full face-to-face -face operation for the last 18 months or so. So this in itself is a really good, um, I mean, it's a really good phase to be. We've done, of course, as you're all aware, we've done a lot of work in terms of the physical spaces and the classrooms and the physical distancing and, and all of that work and the outdoor classrooms. And we've done a lot of work on the face, on the, on the physical space side, but also on the operational side uh, to basically to be able to enhance safety and, and, and you know, the risk of the virus mitigation a lot more in terms of operation as well. So we've, we've done a few measures over the last few weeks, one of which was to, to try and close some gaps that we had in the current processes. One of which, and, and a major one, was around masking um, of bus riders and having, and basically uh, enforcing or, or, or encouraging riders to really keep their masks on the whole ride and not just at the beginning. So we've done a couple of measures there, increased signage, uh, availed a, a reporting email where if a case refuses to be masked during the whole journey, that can be reported and that email is published is on the posters and the buses as well as we've sent an email with that one. And that will be taken very seriously and then we will be dealing with whoever is refusing to, to, uh, to, to wear the mask and it could result in actual revoking of the privilege of, of riding the bus. So we're, we are taking some measures, some very serious measures there. We're also, we've also increased um, a lot, and if you, if you notice around the garden, behind the library, there's a lot more outdoor seating where students and other uh, constituencies can, 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 can sit outdoors and um, uh, sit or eat or whatever. So, so this, we've, we've tried to expand and, and really uh, avail a lot more outdoor seating areas rather than just the plaza. We have also, um, and that was announced a few days ago, that faculty members who wish to, uh, to use uh, face shields, um, uh, are, we've availed that, and, and this, this is available for all faculty who wish to use that. We realize that it's very difficult to teach with a mask on at all times, even though it is, the, it is, a, it is a better level of protection. However, given that our data is proving that our classroom um, um, yeah, our, our contact rates, our positive contact rates in classrooms are extremely, extremely low. And, and it's good that we've got now around eight weeks of data that we've verified that the, the physical distancing is working well, the masking is working, working very well, and faculty are able to, if they wish to use face shields uh, while teaching. So that has also been made available. And as I just mentioned a few minutes before that we're working on enhancement, continuous enhancement of our, of our processes, especially the classroom contact tracing and testing, which is taking a lot of focus, a lot of effort. We're going over and above the, the, uh, the guidelines in terms of keeping our, our community safe. And we and this is taking, we're, we're also looking at that very carefully. More automations are coming in the way in terms of IT systems that would enable us to do this faster and to, and to rely on a more automated link between the actual health a check system and the security system in the back end so that this is done seamlessly with a lot less manual intervention from the clinic team as well as, as the security team and that will lead to a lot more uh, streamlining so we're looking at that we're in, improving as we go and um, yeah and that will be we're looking forward to starting a new uh, I mean ending this semester safely and with a lot more operations in place to start in the in the coming semester, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much, VP Shaker. We have a question from uh, Manuel Schwab. Uh, go ahead, please. You need to un unmute. Hi. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Look, I mean, I'd like to start by saying I appreciate how hard everybody in the community is working, in particular the clinics, and everybody at the front lines of this thing. I have to follow that up by saying that a lot of what I'm hearing today, and I'm sure I'm not the only faculty member feeling this, lacks the sufficient amount of transparency that we need to feel that we are being given the information that we deserve as a community to know we are safe. And some of it, quite frankly, just runs counter to facts. I'd like to echo what the anonymous attendee here asked. They, they, part of the question that wasn't addressed is the clinic is obviously understaffed. Now I've been told that we are dealing with three doctors working in the clinic full-time. 
for a community of 10,000. I'd like confirmation on that, and I'd like to know how that could possibly be construed as a sufficient amount of resourced care in the middle of a pandemic, plateau or not. The second thing is, with, with all due respect, Professor Shecker, if I heard you correctly, you said we've had two cases of late reporting. I personally have had seven, personally, in my classes, where I receive a confirmed medical condition report at the end of a quarantine period. Now, again, I'd like to reiterate, I appreciate how hard everyone is working. I see that. And I admire the community for trying to hold together. But hard work 24 seven with understaffing, under resourcing and a lack of information will not cut it in protecting this community in a pandemic. And I think it's time for us to stop giving positive spin and to start to talk directly about the elephant in the room, which is that we have not done what it takes to make it through this extremely difficult situation. I blame no one, but we need to change the behavior. I'm sorry for the urgent tone, but we are all feeling extremely frayed as a community. We as faculty are at the front lines and we're hurting. Our students are melting down and the clinic that does psychological services can't keep up. The image of this pandemic for those of us in the classrooms is grave. And what we are hearing in this meeting is everything's going beautifully. That tension is not going to build trust in this community. And again, I apologize, this is not blame to anyone in particular, but we need to change the tone of our conversation. Thanks Thank so you, much. Manuel. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, anybody of our panelists, maybe VP Shaker or uh, Provost Abdurrahman, uh, would you like to address that? I, I do, I'm, I'm, we're not in disagreement and we're, I'm, we're acknowledging that we are working on enhancement of systems the, the cases I've referred to are since the beginning of November that have been reported late. There may have been others, and we're ha we can happily look at those, uh, you know, in, in a separate forum. Um, all I want to say is yes, we we are on the short side of staffing on the clinic, but we have reacted to that. And uh, Provost Abdurrahman is aware of that. We've we've hired a few, we've added a few temporary resources to help us through that period over the last two months. So we have four, four full-time doctors. We have actually more. We have. Uh, an additional four uh, part-time doctors. We're, we're hiring additional nurses. So it's not that we are standstill. We are trying to react. Uh, it's a huge workload. We are all acknowledging that. But in addition to that, we are working and we do have a, a plan in place. We've already started the, the automation of the process that will help free up the doctor's time so that they, they focus more on following up the cases rather than dealing with the, with the tracing and the testing and the follow-ups, et cetera. So this we are very, very intentionally doing and we've reacted on both fronts on getting temporary resources as well as system automations. We can happily look at the cases that you've referred to as have been late. Yes, I do acknowledge throughout October there was a lot more delays, but as of beginning of November, we are looking a lot more closely at that. Um, and again, some cases are, are reported late to the clinic. So by the time that starts, it's already late or, or counted as a late case. I'm, I'm talking about two cases that the that we've reacted to since we've got the, the um, the reporting from the student uh, or from the case itself. We're enhancing, we're going through, we're trying to improve. No one at all is, is referring to the fact or, or even claiming that we have a perfect system and that we are all, you know, it, it is difficult. We're working through a pandemic and, um, and we are working it through and enhancing as we go. Thank you, VP Shaker. I'll take one more question from Hanan Sabra before I give the floor to VP Dina Borai uh, to give us an update. Hanan, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Sharif, very much, and thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, I would like to go back to a couple of things. Uh, again, as uh, Mr. Schwab said, uh, Professor Schwab said, we in the classroom are actually facing a higher number of student absences, and uh, it's becoming a real issue. And in that sense, whether it is a COVID case or other cases, or uh, more seriously, actually, which is troubling is the long COVID effect that we are facing students who have had COVID and are suffering from it. So enhancing the measures uh, becomes very important. If I read the email that uh, the management VP Shaker sent to all of us, uh, I think the language uh, actually conveys a sense of um, more leaving it to individuals. We have lived through about two months of leaving it to individuals and still on the plaza, 
at food sites, for instance, Tabali and others, it's the same pattern that we have seen in day one, and it's being uh, uh, replayed over and over again. In the buses, we have the signage, but we people have taken images, uh, pictures actually, uh, of next to the sign, somebody who's not masked. So I think that the message itself and the signage is not doing what needs to be done. Third, which I take to be a very serious thing, I think, uh, Shireen, the rate had been low in the classrooms because we were trying as much as possible to enforce masking for all. As somebody who teaches a graduate seminar for two hours, three hours with a mask, it's not a happy moment. Moving to a face shield is a very, very serious issue that I will highly discourage because as you mentioned, as, as the CDC regulation state, it's actually a tight face mask that can help us maintain our safety. So the face shield that we are getting as faculty uh, is also sending a very serious message uh, that I hope we actually rethink because the remaining months is very important for all of us. We still want to maintain it on campus, but I think in this month it is crucial that these areas need to be tightened. We need to literally enforce whether on the buses or the plaza, the measures that people have to realize now we cannot go on and leave it to self-reporting or members reporting on each other. That's get actually going to create more problems than others. And take and take away the face shield. I'm sorry, as a faculty member, uh, I, I actually think we need to actually both send the message to our students. This is very serious. This is the CDC regulation, not a face shield. Thank you, Hanan. Uh, any follow up about Hanan's points? Vivi Shaker. Uh, yes, uh, minute, I maybe. just want to mention students have to be masked in class, all class, no question about that. We are only referring to faculty members who have an extreme issue with, with, a, with a mask. And that was requested a couple of times from faculty themselves. And that is where we are availing it for whoever really wishes to have a face shield. Only faculty, we're talking only faculty. And the scientific theory behind that is that there is a lot more than one and a half meters between the faculty and the students. So the physical distancing is compensating for that. However, for the 80, 85% of faculty who are very okay using the mask, that is definitely the, the preferred uh, route or the preferred measure. No question about that. Thank you very much, uh, Shireen. Uh, VP Dina Burai, would you like to give us yes. an update please on student life? Um, thank you. Uh, regarding student life, I don't know if I should talk about good news because I'm going to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in terms of our student dorms. Um, we're, we're, we've had only three positive cases uh, from the very beginning of the semester. And as I've said before, in another forum, I'm very proud of our students. And um, we, we're doing fine regarding the, the dorms. And if there is any um, uh, contact case, the whole unit or any suspect case, let me say, the whole unit is tested where the student is, the, the, whether the th one of those three positive cases we've had since the beginning of the semester. And if there are any contact cases, we, are, we go through all the antigen testing needed. So Alhamdulillah, as I've said before, you know, don't want to cast the evil eye all is well with the dorms um and we have about we have about uh, 670 uh, 686 students in total in the dorms this semester um regarding athletics um yes we have opened it up to um uh, alumni uh, but we still have the same system of that uh, no one can just turn up, they have to register beforehand uh, using AC Connect, the gym and the pool and the squash courts. Again, the system is working well and that no one is allowed to use these um, facilities, the gym, the, the pool and the uh, bus uh, and the, um, the uh, squash courts unless they are fully vaccinated. Uh, and of course, as always, uh, and from the beginning of the pandemic, of course, the outdoor, outdoor facilities um, are available for the whole community. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We have a question from Marco. Uh, Marco, do you want to go ahead, go ahead and ask your question? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I wanted just, first of all, uh, to reiterate what Manuel said. Uh, I don't think we are in the business of associating responsibility to individual people. I think uh, we understand that this is a collective effort, largely. But on the other hand, I think there are concerns. And I think I fully share uh, his broad 
consideration about the fact that we are in a much harder position uh, than uh, what the tone of this exchanges would suggest and imply. My own classes, I mean, I had a class of 23 students with four cases. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we can all add this anecdotic evidence, I think, uh, each one of us has some. But my question was mostly related to uh, the data and the threshold. So I appreciate what also the provost has described as data driven decision making. And I think this is uh, this is a good way to proceed. And I think this is also what international standards are about at the moment. What I'm having a problem with are the thresholds and the data that have been chosen for taking these decisions. And um, without getting into the details of one unit up or down, but I did notice that two problematic things on which I would like to have some feedback. First, that the data uh, were changed halfway through the semester. Um, and incidentally, just when we were about to hit what we were told were the previous thresholds of 15 cases on average over a one week period, and the data were changed, uh, those threats, those thresholds were changed exactly at that stage. So my question is, don't you think that that undermines the whole trust in data driven decision making when you're changing uh, those thresholds when we're about to hit them, or when we have already hit them? And my second question is about the 3% incidence rate, uh, the threshold that has been set for moving classes online. Um, I'm Italian, as you know, uh, in Italy, we've had uh, the, we had to face the crisis very early on, unfortunately. Uh, but we've, like many other countries, got some sort of information and good practice early on to try to address it. And currently, the incidence rate for setting a total lockdown in a country like Italy is 0 0.25%. So 250 weekly cases per 100,000 people. AUC is 3%. Don't you think that AUC's threshold is far too imprudent and high and puts the community at risk? Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, again, VP Shaker, please. OK. The, um... The, the, I want to refer to the scientific advisory committee, committee that was put in place and that really examined the whole question, have been examining the whole question of the data and the thresholds for the last, I think, six to seven weeks. And they've come up with a very comprehensive way and data driven way at looking at that. And the basis of the, and yes, you are right that midway uh, after we've opened around a few weeks ago, then the, the, the new triggers were announced. And, and the whole basis of that work was based on Minnesota Health Department and recommendations for higher ed in specific. And that was examined in depth in that committee. And that is the, the basis and the rationale for the whole new way of the four uh, stages or the, 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 the green, yellow, orange, and, and red uh, stages that were shared. This is a very, this is a very well studied and very, very, I mean, it is a scientific approach and it is the closest we could get to a higher ed education like us. So, so what I, in the last year we've been experimenting and learning as we go, the 15 was a guesstimate on where we were last year based on national numbers, etc. cetera. I, I, I don't want to say it's, it wasn't very scientific, but it wasn't very scientific. It was based on trial and error. And as we go, we learn. This time we sat down and said, I'm not part of that committee. I, as administration, we take the recommendations and we see how to best implement them, et cetera. So, so that was really studied very well. And that's why the basis of the 14 day rolling average versus the seven and the cutoffs and the triggers were very well studied in relation to percentages. So I just wanna reassure assure you that this is not at all an ad hoc or a sudden change from 15 to 21. On the contrary, we, are, we, we were getting into a much more studied rationale and basis. And the application of it is a lot more, it's not just one single number working together at 15 or a 21, but it is, a couple of measures working together to move us from stage to stage. Currently, we're at a yellow. Yes, we're not safe at all. I mean, uh, if, if we move from the from the 15, 16 we're at now up until the 21 and we stay a couple of, we will move to orange. So we're all taking it extremely seriously there. Um, but again, it, it is a, it, it's moving to a more scientific approach or not the reverse. And the numbers have changed to the better, we believe, because it is it was based on a scientific approach. Uh, and and uh, and yeah, that, that's what that's what, that's the background. And I think that was also shared very transparently on what and why we're changing and what was the basis and who's making the decisions or recommendations and how we're reacting to that and implementing that. 
So thank I you. hope I have answered most of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shireen. So uh, we have a question yeah. from- Dr. Ali, I may add something if Please. I may. Yeah. Also, I want uh, to, to talk to Bilferi. Uh, I am the one who established uh, the scientific committee and there was a reason behind this. When, we, when, I, uh, when I was an acting president in the summer and I asked how did we come up with the 15 number as a number, uh, there was no science behind it. Uh, and one, the minute I discovered that, that there was no science behind it, that's one, two, that also that number was established at the beginning of COVID, I uh, decided to establish a scientific committee from experts on campus. All of them are faculty uh, uh, in, or in public health, except uh, one who's in data science to help the committee to actually uh, manage data if needed. Uh, and uh, we give them the autonomy to guide our decisions. And the, the committee have been working uh, almost day and night every day. They meet and uh, to guide our decisions. Uh, so that's where the change from seven days average to 14 days average came in. Also, when we decided, when we were discussing uh, the dashboard and uh, we, uh, we were talking to replace the seven days average by 14 days av average, since we're using that now, we collectively decided to keep both in order not to confuse the, uh, uh, the community. The community are used to look at the seven days average, while actually our decision now is based on the 14 days average. That's why we kept the two uh, averages in out of transparency for our uh, uh, community. Thank you, Thank Dr. You, Dr. Rahman. So while we're at it, Nuran Abdullah of the caravan, and I'm just rephrasing, is a bit worried about the mechanism by which students who test positive for COVID can actually make up their classes. And uh, excuse me, I'm sorry about that. And uh, she's asking, why can't we go ahead and uh, mandate So, uh, so uh, let me address that uh, question, uh, Dr. Ali. Uh, uh, Nuran, we uh, realize that uh, our classrooms are not equipped with the right equipment to uh, make sure that our classes are delivered uh, online and face-to-face -face at the same time. Uh, when a student is absent from class, we would like to offer him the opportunity to attend the class over, uh, through on Zoom at the same time when other students are attending in class. Currently, we have nine classrooms that can actually provide us with that uh, flexibility. Uh, the Board of Trustees has decided to spend $1.7 million in order to uh, equip all of our uh, classrooms uh, with the needed equipment uh, to ensure that we can deliver the class, all, all of our classes face-to-face -face and online at the same time. Uh, that's how, that's, this is, uh, uh, and she, my colleague Shirin Shaker can add to that, but uh, we looked also at the capacity of how and when can we equip all those classrooms with the uh, uh, right equipment and also uh, do a little bit of uh, changes in the classrooms to allow that uh, dual delivery uh, modality. Uh, we will be able to finish all of our almost 140 classrooms by the end of this uh, coming summer. So be uh, patient with us. We're working on that too. Uh, by the end of January, we will move from, from nine classrooms to 29 classrooms uh, capable of delivering classes in dual modality uh, uh, mode. Uh, so it's kind of our infrastructure is not allowing us to, uh, 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 to deliver all of our classes in dual modality. Uh, by the end of the summer, by the end of the summer, we will have that uh, capability. Thank you. So, uh, a question to President Delel, uh, and it, it says, "Leading with care." It's about care again. Uh, is a great motto. But how does the administration attempt to put feelings into actions for students, faculty, and staff? Or, if I may ask, what is the administration's strategy regarding the interaction with these different stakeholders? That's a question to the president. Uh, um, first thing is to engage and to engage systematically. As I said, I've been, uh, you know, I've been meeting even in the limited time I've been here. I've been meeting with students, I've been meeting with alumni, but of course, I've also been meeting uh, intensively with the Senate leadership and with, with faculty members. Um, 
next week we have a meeting with the Senate Executive Committee and the, the agenda is to come up with a roadmap for how we engage on various issues that we need to be working on collectively and through which modalities and which forums and, and, and bodies. But the thing, I mean, the primary thing, how do, how do we, I mean, we engage, we meet. Um, by the way, I know there's been different approaches to this subject, but anyone can write to me and talk to me. And the only limit is, of course, is the number of hours I have every day. But otherwise, I'm open. My door is open. I have an open door policy, and I'd be happy to talk to anyone within the university community, um, which isn't to say that I will be able to solve people's problem or provide the support, because the support is provided by the whole university, not by me. But I'm open to talk, and whenever uh, whenever uh, is appropriate, I will, I will uh, even facilitate. I'll work with my colleagues in, in the relevant units to 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 address uh, issues. We've already done some of that, and hopefully we'll be able to do that more more, more of that uh, more systematically. If I may say a word about the the conversation about the pandemic, of course, on the technicalities, my colleagues are in a much better uh, position to to address uh, and have been addressing uh, you know the questions that were raised um, by uh, by. Uh, by members of our community. But I think, I mean, the thing to keep in mind is that, to quote something that I've read recently, in many ways, the future of the virus is now. It's not, we're not waiting for the future. There is, we will not wake up one day and decide that the virus is gone. At best, and in fact, this is already happening. It will become a manageable uh, problem that societies can live with and you know, deploying all the tools that we're learning how to use, deploying the vaccines and the, the, the uh, medicines that are being developed and so on and so forth. Um, but this institution, along with this country, along with most countries and economies, economies in the world, along with pretty much all of higher education institutions and educational institutions in the world, have decided that we can no longer be societies dominated by the virus we have to find ways to move forward. Now, as we do that, you know, none of us, none of us, and I speak of every one of us, and I speak of a global phenomenon, not just of AUC, has been ready to deal with this, with this pandemic. The pandemic actually took the world by surprise. It shouldn't have, you know, one can argue that the world should have been a little more prepared to deal with, with situations like this, but it took the world by and large by surprise. And in the beginning, we responded in a particular way and then found out that it's not going to disappear in the summer or in a couple of months. So we started then working on alternatives and coming up with, coming up with situations. So as we, and you know, to go back to the, to the idea of care, as we learn how to deal with this pandemic, it is a pandemic and our concerns are serious. I am concerned for my family. I'm concerned for my friend. I'm concerned for, for our community, just as every one of us is. Uh, we have to balance two things. We have to balance the need to move, to restore as much normalcy as we can, and at the same time address to the best of our abilities the, the very serious concerns that we all have, concerns about our safety, our collective safety, our individual safety. So we need to balance the two. And quite honestly, I mean, the, the honest answer to many of the questions is that we will have to work together. We have to keep on honing and refining our responses, figuring out what else we can do and how, you know, you know, identifying collectively what some of the concerns are and what is the best way, what is the reasonable way of dealing with them and, and, and so on and so forth. We don't have ready-made answers for, for all of the questions that you're raising. There will be more questions, no matter how many questions we answer, there will be more questions that will come up and we'll have to listen to each other and figure out how best to deal with them but we cannot, we have to move forward. This is the decision that this institution made before I came, but I would have made the same decision if I, if I, if it was, if I, if I was asked to make it. I made it in, my, in the earlier institution where I worked. I know that pretty much institutions all over the world are making that decision to move forward while deploying all of the tools that we have lear learned and are learning to use so that we could maintain a, a reasonable level of safety for our community. Um, so, you know, 
again, uh, my colleagues are in a better, better position to address the specifics, and there are probably things that we can do better. Uh, you know, in the last, not just last, the very last Senate meeting, but in the, the one before, there were concerns that were raised by senators, and I know that the the you know the administration uh, took measures to to address some of the logistical questions. There are still issues that we're working on in terms of uh, exemptions and so on. And again, hopefully this will be forthcoming before long. So we're working on addressing. I mean, you know, I know that you know we take all of your concerns seriously and do our best to answer the the, the and address these concerns. Sometimes we we'll make mistakes, and we need to work together on figuring out how best to address the situation while we move forward and try to restore normalcy and maintain normalcy to the extent that we can. Thank you very much, President Delel. Uh, again, we have to wrap up and I do apologize for everybody who typed a question and we couldn't answer duly. Uh, thank you, President Delel, Provost Abdurrahman, all the distinguished panelists, and uh, thank you community for attending today's uh, campus conversation. Until we meet next time, thank you very much and have a great evening. <laughs>